Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Sunday, March 22nd, 2020, and this is the weekly market update. So yes, we're going to talk about, in the reality check, the coronavirus, because it's dominating everything right now. And when I say dominating, um, I think the key word is dominating. Uh, <laughs> Everything is being talked about this. Everybody that I run into, this is all they talk about. And the level of idiocy, panic, and misinformation is staggering. And I'm on a job site, and I have people out there, you know, we really had to get things calmed down. People were threatening to drag up, leave, not enough food, we're going to run out of food, uh, I have to go to the store. My wife called, there's no more food in this grocery stores. Um... If you get this, you'll die in three days, all kinds of misinformation. So there's a lot of panic and idiocy and stupidity. But one of the things I like to do is, like I said, focus on facts. And I have, you know, identified several good resources for tracking this in real time. I'll put links to them uh, in the show notes. But one of the sites I go to is uh, a data set um, and it gets updated daily for all the countries, state by state. And basically, this is the daily new cases in the United States. And so what we're seeing here, and what we have seen before, is these diseases kind of follow a bell curve as they increase. And then you can see as we've taken action to lock everything down, we look like we may have peaked on new cases and be heading downwards. Now, this is not a guarantee. It could very easily spike next week. I don't know. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is this is following uh, a curve that we were expecting it to follow. Um, th this may be just a manifestation of the lockdowns that are going down. I mean, every day I see a new press release of some governor saying everybody has to stay inside, only essential travel, that kind of thing. So... Um, hopefully this is the effect of that, and this has now begun to meet, reach maximum pessimism or maximum effect, and it's now going to recede. The other encouraging thing is this is the daily death toll rate, and it's been declining for several days also. So obviously it's in, unfortunate that people are dying. Um, as I've said before, I'm not going to get into to the... Uh, what's the total deaths versus other forms of death. I mean, everybody's going to die someday of something. And, you know, the amount of people that die of tuberculosis and malaria is quite higher than the people, amount of people that die from coronavirus. But such is what the world we live in. As I was explaining to somebody earlier this week, um, I don't live in the world I want to. I live in the world that I'm living in, and I have to deal with it that way. So this is a investing and speculating video podcast. So that's how we're going to deal with it rationally. So why do I bring this up? Why is this important from our perspective? Well, in the markets, markets are trying to be forward looking all the time. They're constantly taking in, market participants are taking in information. They are processing it and they're trying to determine what's going to happen in the future, or a lot of them are. Um, I don't think that's the best way to operate, but I understand that's how most market participants operate. So what we've seen here, kind of in conjunction with the amount of new cases going down and the amount of deaths going down, looks like the volatility index, which measures volatility, obviously, and we've seen a lot of that in the last uh, month or so, it looks like it may have peaked also. So, you know, we have this steady state where the market really wasn't uh, very volatile Then this market you know, the disease was really building in here and no one cared until they cared. That's kind of one of my theses that I've said before. These things don't matter until they matter and then they matter a whole bunch. And this was a perfect example. But as we also talked about in several of these videos in the last month, at some point, this is going to end. Is this the beginning of the end? You know, um, or as, you know, Winston Churchill said during World War II, when you're in hell, you just got to keep marching through hell. So I think that this is optimistic. This looks good. What it means for us is 
is it time i said in another previous video when would i be looking to put money together or put money to work in the market and some of the things that we care about or some of the things that we think are extremely undervalued i.e uranium i.e gold stocks i.e this tanker phenomenon that uh, we're going to talk more about later on in this video and it looks like this is the time um, as I said, markets are forward-looking. If we get any good pieces of information, I would suggest to you that, uh, and this is good information, if it stays consistent and the trend is down in the volatility index, if the trend is down in deaths, if the trend is down in new cases, we are going to see uh, probably a lot of uh, all that money that washed out, a good ch portion of it, or a big chunk of it at least, is going to wash back in. So I think you want to be thinking about if you wanted to put new money to get into the market. And I'm not talking to the guy out there that's saying, hey, John, you're nuts. Don't you see what's going on? And has a chicken little mentality. We don't operate like that here. We're rational. We think logically. We know this is going to end. We have many, many examples of previous pandemics, epidemics, flus. And other things you know i was talking to my guys the other day and trying to talk to them in our safety meeting and i got a a, a package of the uh, wipes uh, sense antiseptic wipes that you can buy clorox wipes whatever and they had been sitting around for well before this thing even showed up and i pointed out i started reading off the back of the package of the things that it kills you know, rhinovirus, H1N1 virus, and oh, by the way, it says human coronavirus. And I said, guys, this, this coronavirus is a manifestation of a known family of viruses that causes uh, upper respiratory, you know, infections, i.e. similar to the colds and flus. And in some people with comorbidity and some people that are, are, are susceptible uh, because of other conditions they have, it causes an increased chance of dying. But it's no different than many other things that we've been through in the past, and this sh too shall pass. And that doesn't mean I'm minimizing it or something like that, but you can't have a chicken little mentality. And this panic and idiocy that's taken over, I mean, I was listening to Martin Armstrong, who's a very famous investor, uh, you can look him up, uh, and he was talking about, you know, are we really going to crash the world economy over this? I guess we're going to, but that's going to lead to opportunities for people that are rational, people that understand what is happening, people that understand that this isn't the Black Plague and we're going to, you know, 40% of the world's population is going to die. You know, I'm going to get the retort then from the wise ass out there that's not educated or that's a, you know, a chicken little. Well, look at what's going on in Italy. Well, look what's going on in Italy. In Northern Italy, you had an influx of Chinese immigrants that were doing, uh, a lot of business there. There's a lot of old people there. There's a lot of other things that you need to look at. And this isn't really the time to study it in the middle of the pandemic. They will do that after it's over, like they did the 1968-69 Hong Kong uh, pandemic, where you know half a million people died. Like H1N1 back during the Obama administration. I can just go down the list of the various things. So this too will end. At some point, it will end. At some point, things will begin to return to normal. At some point, uh, money, as people's fear goes down, as volatility decreases, people will be looking to put money back into undervalued assets. We want to be there first, i.e., Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is going to be. If you wait until the all clear is there, you're going to miss out on the bargains. It's just that simple. So previous epidemics, here's the Spanish flu, the one that did kill tens of millions of people in 1917 to 1918. There's a 33% decline in the Dow. The panic on this coronavirus has been worse. This is an actual pandemic that killed tens of millions of people. Now, maybe the information flow wasn't as great back then. Maybe they, you know, they didn't have Twitter and people on CNN and left-wing journalists trying to, you know, destroy an economy and a president in an election year, which is part of what's going on here with the hysteria that's been created by the press. Uh, not just because of the political leanings, because it's, you know, it makes money, it's clickbait, it's eyeballs. I mean, if you don't see that, that's part of it. Then I'm, I mean, that that's my view. 
Yeah, 33% decline without a bounce in the Spanish flu, which is a typical bear market. And tens of millions of people died during this flu. Let's look at the Hong Kong flu that I talked about. Uh, again, I get a lot of this stuff off Twitter because I've cultivated a very interesting and eclectic group of people on Twitter that are way, way smarter than me. And, you know, I... You know, I'm not under with the cat videos and, you know, little kid videos of uh, riding a tricycle. I'm, you know, following and inter interacting with very intelligent people that have a lot of experience. And so here's an example right here. Here's the Hong Kong flu. You can look this up on uh, Wikipedia about how extensive it was. It was brought from Asia back to the United States, mostly by returning troops from Vietnam. But anyways, as it applies to markets... This thing killed 100,000 Americans. There was 1 million deaths worldwide, and the market dropped 36% from all-time highs after experiencing a 20-year bull market followed by a V-shaped recovery. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going to have a V-shaped recovery because of the idiocy, idiocy and panic that's taken over. We didn't sequester the entire world's population in their houses for a month uh, to beat the virus back then. I mean, they just... It just went through the population. People developed immunity to it. Uh, some people died, and life went on, and markets recovered. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is not to minimize that you know people are going to die or sound ghoulish, and 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 be insensitive to the fact that people die. People die every day. No one thinks twice about it. You know, people still take baths, and the radio falls in, and they get electrocuted. I mean, it's all people die every day. So. What I'm trying to say to you is that this is not the first time this has happened where the markets drop because of a pandemic or epidemic, and it won't be the last time that it recovers. And we will have subsequent uh, events like this as we, in the future. It's just the way it is. But we will recover at some point. So here's the coronavirus. We've had a 36% decline already without a bounce. I mean, it's been straight down. If you look at the episodes before, they weren't, they were similar, like in the Hong Kong drop, we had a almost fall off, of pretty large. And then if you look at the Spanish flu, which you had these intermediate bounces, and in our particular case right now with the coronavirus on the Dow, I mean, it's almost been a waterfall drop. So um, I think I attribute a lot of this to, again, the speed of information, the overload of information, the panic and hysteria, the lack of information, and the general stupidity and idiocy of the general population. Um, my local Sam's Club, I usually go over there, like I've said, every couple weeks, pick up cashews and, you know, kind of Mexican water I like, mineral water. I don't even go near the place right now, not because I'm scared of flu, because I don't want to stand in line in the hot sun for five hours with lines wrapped around the parking lot because people are in there trying to buy toilet paper. I mean, I still don't get the toilet paper and bottled water thing on the coronavirus. You know, like I said before, I think in another video, I think it's just a manifestation of the everyman inability to not be able to control this thing, not really understand and have any control of what's happening. But you can have some, you can feel like you're doing something uh, and give yourself some psychological uh, get those neurons from stop firing, those fear, if you go stand in line and stock up on essentials. And I think that gives some people or a lot of people some comfort. So I think that's where it's coming from. You know, the world economy is not going to stop. I will tell you this right now, uh, regardless of this coronavirus um, is beaten, you know, we've talked about the deaths going down and it's going to roll over. Uh, the world one of two things is going to have to happen here fairly quickly, probably in the next two weeks, I would suggest. Um, you know, we had the spring equinox, I believe it was on the 19th, three days ago. We should see temperatures start to rise. And like I pointed out before, Dr. John Nichols, uh, professor at Hong Kong University and expert on coronavirus, uh, stated that it's one thing that these viruses hate is sunlight or three things, sunlight, uh, i.e. UV rays, um, warm weather and humidity. They just, their half-lives or their ability to survive outside of a host is compromised by these three things. So I'm suggesting that hopefully that will be the cause of the, as things start to warm up and various areas that this will kind of die off like the normal flu and cold season does. 
because if it doesn't and we keep going, people can't just sit in their house for, you know, I've heard all these wacky things. You have Governor Newsom in California, 20 million people in the state of California will get this. Well, you know, I don't know if that's true or not. I guess there's not a 0% chance that would happen, but we all can't sit in our houses for 180 days or a year and a half until this thing's totally expunged. Within a two weeks, a decision is going to have to be made and people are just going to have to go back to work. I mean, half the people in this country don't have, you know, three or $400 in a checking account. Um, all bars and restaurants shut down. Uh, you can get to carry out around here, but you know, the volume of you know, your waitresses and waiters and that kind of stuff, service staff. You know, I read an article about a guy that was a employee at a Marriott hotel. Uh, he was sent home. Uh, he went to go get unemployment and he was told, well, you're not eligible for unemployment because uh, you're not laid off. You're just on zero hours. That's what the Marriott had reported to, I guess, the state. So what I'm suggesting to you is that this can't just go on forever. Um, if it doesn't burn itself out or the precautions that are being taken don't get this under control probably in the next two weeks because this idea that the government can have everybody just sit at home and play video games and watch Netflix for six months and they'll just print a bunch of money and give it to people you know I guess we're gonna see if Stephanie Kelton's MMT theories are really true because I'm gonna talk about that later in the video the stimulus wave has started it's gonna be greater and exacerbated uh, than anybody thought but I again ask the question, where does the real wealth and capital come to just give people money? You can print money, but uh, that's what banana republics do, and that's why they have hyperinflations. But that's a whole other deal. I want to focus on this. We've seen it before. We've seen what's happened to markets in these same situations that were even worse than what the situation we're in, and they recover eventually. That's what I'm trying to convey here. And with the VIX rolling over, beginning to roll over, okay, with the deaths going down, with the new cases appearing to roll over following that bell curve that a lot of epi you know experts on epidemics say is going to happen you know that is uh positive so we'll continue to monitor that want to talk about tankers again you know I, I put the title of this slide up here one word for you son tankers kind of reminds me of the uh movie that was in the late 60s um the graduate with dustin hoffman graduates from college he doesn't really know what he wants to do i remember he's at this coming home party or graduation party his parents threw for him and everybody was giving him advice and one of his dad's colleagues came up to him and said well, i have one word for you son plastics so this is kind of a you know it kind of reminded me of that um but here's what we're looking at here this is a actually a probably a week old chart um, basically, you have the different types of tankers here. These are the very large crude carriers, the biggest, the next biggest. You know, these very large crude carriers carry 2 million barrels plus of oil. Suez Max is about a million, and you just work your way down. Afro Max is smaller than, <coughs> excuse me, smaller than the Suez Maxes. These uh, LR2, LR1s, and MRs, these are product tankers, okay? Uh, they don't carry crude oil, but they carry uh, jet fuel, gasoline, naphtha, refined products, basically. They, that's why they call them clean tankers. And what we saw is, uh, you know, this is a 2019 uh, average, you know, $29,000 $29, a day to uh, charter a very large crude carrier. Year-to-date 2020, 75000 Last week, uh, 217,000 we've seen fixtures, okay? Why is this? Well, we talked about it last week, and this is why we're so high on tankers. You know, there's always a bull market somewhere. There's always something going on, even in the mire and dire uh, things that are going on here with the coronavirus. Why? Okay. I'm going to list a, or put in the show notes, a interview that Harris Kupperman did I think it was Friday, Thursday or Friday, talking about this whole tanker thing again. I'll put a link to his blog, Adventures in Capitalism, where he talks about crude oil contango and how that works. So let's just talk about why this is the way it is and why it's such an opportunity. So we've got everybody in lockdown, okay? The whole world basically. So commerce is screeching to a halt. People are not going to work. People are working from home. There's no air travel. There's no vacations. 
everything's kind of grinding to a halt. So that means that oil supply is not really, you can't just go and turn off all the wells like a flip of a switch. Um, you can really wreck an oil well if you do that. So, you know, decisions get taken to slowly but surely shut things down. You may have a marginal producing strip, strip, stripper well, and it makes us, you know, 15 or 20 barrels a day. Um, if you shut that well in, you probably won't be able to restart it. So people will make long-term decisions, not just based on, you know, a month or two. You know, these boards or these small companies will get together and say, hey, look, we're, we're losing money on every barrel. we got to start shutting in production. But we know that long-term that could affect our business. So this crude oil continues. The point is the crude oil continues to be produced, but it's not being consumed, right, because of the, the effects of everybody being shut in their home. So it has to go somewhere, right? Um, it can go into storage. There's above ground storage. You hear a lot in the news about Cushing, Oklahoma, big tank farms that they have, refineries have on, on storage uh, at their refineries, but it's only limited. It's not, it's finite. And you're continuing to, you know, if the world supply of oil is around 100 million barrels a day, uh, or well, that was a demand previous to this economic crash that we've had because of the la la demands collapse, you know, you're not going to see supply just fall off immediately. So if the demand's actually 80 million barrels, I don't know. I don't know. We don't know yet how much demand's fallen off. We could say it's fallen off. Let's just say it's 10 or, or 20 million barrels a day that's fallen off. Uh, it has to go somewhere, right? So what happens is, is that uh, a situation develops in the markets called contango where you where you will see and you are seeing right now you can look this up you will see the spot price of oil whatever it is i don't even remember let's just say it's 25 but you will see the further you go out on the curve uh into the futures market the price is higher that's a market that's in contango right so you can Conceivably, and a lot of trading companies do this, and even oil companies will do this, oil refiners and other people that know what they're doing, they will buy oil in the spot market at 25, let's say, buy a million barrels or 2 million barrels of oil in the spot market for $25, $25 a barrel. Then they can immediately go into the futures market simultaneously and sell that and lock in, sell that same oil into the future uh, at a guaranteed price, lock it in with a futures contract that may be anywhere from 12 to $15 a barrel higher than the current spot price. Now they just have to store that 2 million barrels somewhere uh, until and pay storage, uh, whether in a tank farm or as what's happening now on oil tankers, then they can keep the difference plus a little bit of money for insurance and whatever little fees they have. So it's very lucrative that when these oil markets enter contango, uh, this has happened before, this is not the first time this has happened, but it, the situation normally doesn't last for very long. Why this is so lucrative this time is because we think that this can last for an extended period of time. Why? Well, as we talked about last week, the oil, or a couple weeks ago, the oil wars. You know, Saudi Arabia decided uh, during this whole situation with demand falling off that they were going to increase production because, for whatever reason, you know, I mean, we speculated that could be anywhere from wanting to finish off U.S. shale. They got pissed off at the Russians because the Russians wouldn't go along with the cut during the recent meetings to who knows what. And then the Russians said that they're going to start pumping. So you have all these countries increasing production into a market with falling demand. The price has crashed and it's exacerbated this contango. So you have even more oil that no one needs or wants, and then it has to go somewhere. In the main, in the meantime, um, you know, people in these trading companies were seeing it. That's why you need to be on Twitter, be following me because. We're linked to a lot of guys. We're getting real-time information on these tanker charters that are happening on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, where we're seeing these tankers being leased just to store oil. So I think that, you know, even if this thing got cured tomorrow, this coronavirus, you're not going to go right back. Nothing, you're just going to flip a switch and all the demand is just going to come back immediately. So the longer this thing stays like this, the longer people stay in lockdown, the longer that this uh, continues, um, it's going to exacerbate this situation. So now you have this tanker stocks, which have been thrown out 
uh, baby with the bath water. They've been crushed, like, because everybody's just selling everything because panic and idiocy takes over, like I said before. But these tanker markets are exploding. The daily, you know, it's right here. I mean, if the average that you were getting was $29,000 a day last year, the average so far year to date is 75, but the recent are over 100,000 and you're, and your operating costs a day are eight thousand or ten thousand dollars a day. Uh, that's a tremendous amount of money. You know, create that's a that's a money machine. That's an ATM. Plus the fact that most of these tanker stocks are selling for less than that asset value. Some of these companies are selling for fifty percent of their net asset value. So what are they doing? Well, there's only a few things you can do with all this excess cash if you're a tanker company. You can buyback stock which is what's happening i've seen buybacks announced this week Nor nordic american tankers uh said they're going to start buying back stock that you're going to see other companies doing that because they have this wave of cash flow coming at them um, they can pay dividends uh they've been talking about that i've heard many companies talk about what their dividend payout payout uh plans are going to be uh going forward and then you can buy more tankers so um, they will eventually do that and, and ruin this whole thing. That's what they always do. Uh, but this is one of the most lucrative times in the history of these tanker markets. We've talked about it before. These are not buy and hold uh, long-term investments. Tanker and shipping stinks as a business. It's a cyclical business. For the most part, they very most of the time break even or lose money. Most of the time, lose money. The managements are not very good. They're not good capital allocators. But there are times where it can go from six months to three years, two years, whatever. We think it is. I think it's going to be longer than six months where they make a tremendous amount of money because of these type of situations that happen, and the stocks really react uh, very well. So I think they haven't really moved yet. They had some movement last year because just the general IMO 2020 and the general you know, end of a long bear market in tankers. Uh, that's now being gasoline poured on the fire. And those stocks have been thrown out with all the other stocks. But at some point, fundamentals do matter. So there's still an opportunity here. So I suggest that you listen to the podcast with uh, Harris and the interview we just did recently and go back and read the articles. And if you don't understand how this works, the contango and how trading companies uh, lock in their profits by storing crude oil for some period of time, buying cheap now and selling in dear in the futures market, you need to do some investigation so you really understand that. What's the downside? I mean, well, anything can happen, right? I mean, this there could be a cure for coronavirus tomorrow and everything goes back to normal over the next month and the contango would disappear. You wouldn't need the storage. Um, the Saudis and Russians could come to some deal that would, you know, constrict supply. You wouldn't have the amount of oversupply that we're looking at. But as long as people have went nuts and are just going to, you know, go from 100 million barrels of demand to 80 or 70, that 20 or 30, 10, 20, 30, whatever you want to do, put it in a spreadsheet of excess supply has to go somewhere. And it's and people are starting to lease ships and uh and put it on ships so that will continue that's why you gotta you know follow people what's going on and pay attention but this is a tremendous opportunity to double triple or quadruple your money i think over the next uh, rest of the year uh and i think when the money comes back into the market uh people will start seeing this and these things are going to attract a lot of money so uh that's what i've you know, talked about this before. We'll continue to follow it because I think this is really something that in the middle of all this nuttiness, I mean, I've really pushed in big into this, bought a lot of tanker stocks. I've got some call options on some of these companies. And I think they're going to, you know, if this thing turns around in the next month and the news gets better in the liquidity returns of the markets, uh, we're going to see a tremendous run in some of these stocks in my view, or potentially. Okay, let's talk about liquidity and, and what's happening. You know, I got this off Twitter. This is like a few days old also, right? March 18th. There's been more announcements since then. I mean, trillions and trillions of dollars of stimulus, liquidity, money printing, whatever you want to call it. Let's just go down the list. You know, 1.5 trillion in repos, 1.1 trillion commercial paper relief, 1 trillion in U.S. physical stimulus, probably more to come. 
750 billion of QE from the ECB, 600 billion in QE from the Fed, 600 billion bank loan guarantees, France and UK, 500 billion in loans in Germany, 300 billion in Japanese stimulus proposed, 100 billion in physical stimulus across Europe. You know, we were talking about this. This is the, the, the why is this happening? What's going to happen? Well, I mean, if you shut down the world economy, I mean, you're going to have, I mean, I've seen anything from, well, this is going to be a mild recession to this is going to be greater than the Great Depression. No one knows how many people are out of work already. You know, we haven't really seen, we need to see over the next week or two, unemployment claims and how they come in. And I think that's really going to shock a lot of people about how many people are laid off. And like I said, most people, half the people, at least in the U.S., I don't know how it is in these other countries, they don't have any savings. They can't just sit at their house for months and not live. And then you're going to have all these other interventions by the government, like you can't foreclose on a guy's house, uh, you can't collect rent. Well, how does the landlord who has the house under mortgage to the bank pay his uh, mortgage if the renter doesn't have to pay any rent? I mean, you're just going to have a lot of turmoil in this markets, and the government you know, the call, because people have been conditioned for this because of, you know, 50 years of statism, 60 or longer, you know, somebody has to do something. So you have, you know, all these politicians fighting to get in front of the camera and saying, yep, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to have small business relief. We're going to bail out the airlines. We're going to give money to these people. We're going to give everybody a thousand dollars a month. We're going to do, you know, all these proposals and where's the money coming from? Well, we can just print it. I mean, somebody that says that doesn't understand economics. If you go and buy a, a basket of groceries, that represents work done, okay? That represents sweat and toil and capital that has been spent with the idea that it can be, you know, recovered with a slight profit. If you're just printing money out of thin air and giving it to people, you can increase the money supply very rapidly, unlimited infinity, but you can't supply increase the supply of goods as quickly. What happens if supply of money goes up rapidly and the supply of goods does not? Well, you have inflation, you have, and you have the economy not functioning properly now, and then all these statist interventions because somebody has to do something. We've told you to sit in your house because there's an outbreak of the cold and flu. And no one's thinking through that destroying the world economy may be worse than allowing this flu to play out. That's what I'm saying. Within two or three weeks, people are going to have to go back to work, and people are going to get sick, and people are probably going to die. But you can't crash the world economy. What's going to happen then? I mean, do people actually think they're just going to sit in their house for three months and just go to the store, and this thing will just bleed itself out, and then everything will be fine? No commerce is going to take place for three months, and people have $400 to their name, half the people in the country. How's that work? So what I'm suggesting to you is I don't know how this is going to play out. Nobody does, but I do know that politicians are going to overreact. They already are. That's what they do. They're concerned with one thing and one thing only, and that's getting reelected making sure that they're seen to be doing something. They're not, no politician. I mean, what, what, politician's going to stand up there and say, yep, um, it's time to go back to work. You, everything's all clear. And then, you know, somebody, this thing has another outbreak in some city again and, and re, re flares up. I mean, the person will be out of office. So this is probably going to be extreme. The conditions going forward as far as the lockdowns, and that's going to cause even more stress on the economy. And I guess that we're just going to have more stimulus. There's, I mean, I think that, you know, coming out of this thing, which like I said, we eventually will, my hope is based on what I'm reading about viruses and how they work, you know, as, as the temperatures warm up, as the humidity get, starts increasing, as people get out and get some sun, I mean, get some vitamin D, go out in the sunlight and get some vitamin D. It will really help you. Uh, you know, sunlight is good for you and it, virus hates it. So you know, my hope is it burns itself out, but if it doesn't, I mean, I don't know how long this idiocy is going to go on for. And the longer it goes on, the more damage will be done to the economy and the more stimulus or help or whatever. I mean, this is really going to possibly lead to some toppling of some governments possibly and things of that nature. So I don't know what the repercussions are, but that's why I like gold. That's why I like cash. Um, 
I still think the dollar is still of a haven. It seems to be a haven right now. A lot of people are just in cash, but I think there's going to be some opportunities here as we come out of this thing. So um, they're not stopping building nuclear reactors. The power's still on, um, and uranium looks very tasty to me. I mean, there, there's going to be centimillionaires and billionaires created probably out of this uranium market once it finally turns around and goes. I mean, you can literally buy these assets at almost pennies on the dollar now. So um, I know it's painful. It's counterintuitive. I mean, when I'm sitting there trying to buy, you know, Paladin stock at four cents Australian or whatever it was, I mean, you're, you're feeling the the throw up in the back of your throat. I mean, it's like you're really thinking to yourself as you're getting ready to hit that buy button, is this really a good idea? But that's kind of how I want to feel if I'm a contrarian at this point, because I know a year, two years, three, you know, three years from now, we're going to be talking about the coronavirus. I don't think so. At least I hope not. So, um, but I do know that the nuclear build out is not going to end and the fuel, the lack of investment conceivably leads to a fuel shortage and these stocks roaring at some point. So maybe look back and say it was the buy of my lifetime. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Um, I appreciate the listeners. Uh, channel continues to grow. I appreciate it. Welcome all the new listeners. Respectful commenting is appreciated. I get a lot of comments, get a lot of people emailing me. I cannot give you personal financial advice. I cannot tell you what companies to buy. I tell you what I'm doing. I tell you why I'm doing it. Um, but, uh, you know, I felt a lot of pain. A lot of my ideas have got crushed. Um, but I feel like with all this stimulus that's happening and what's more to come, I mean, this is just the start, by the way, we're going to see after we have mass unemployment, we're going to see public works projects, the whole shebang, I'm thinking. But uh, anyway, um, I'm just one man with an opinion and, uh, and that's not necessarily the correct one, I guess. So, but uh, I continue to educate myself. I continue to fight my biases and I just want to bring my view and my spin on the news to you or how I interpret things and uh, at least get you thinking and maybe we can have a dialogue going forward. All right, guys, that's it for this week and uh, have a good week. We'll talk to you next Saturday or Sunday. Thank you.